Welcome, welcome everybody. Just come on in. This is where I wish I had a little bit of music, right? We'll start right at 10 o'clock. Welcome everybody. I can't see you, so I'm hoping there's like 50,000 people out there. I'm kidding. I wouldn't, I'm just <laughs> anticipating people are out there on screen. You can see that? Oh, good. Oh, yes, you can see that, okay. Okay, 10 a.m. right on the dot, and I want to welcome you all to our kickoff for NEFA California. Very excited to be here with you today. Why? Why are we doing this? Yet another virtual meeting. Uh, we just came off of P plus P, which I'll talk about a little bit later, but, um, you know, this is another opportunity for us. We had our E3 conference, Dominate Your Decade, which is our theme for the year, um, but we wanted to bring you all together again because this is really the official kickoff for the next 15 months of uh, working with you and the board. Um, I am Mimi Yoon Lee and I am going to be your president for the next 15 months. So I'm excited to be here with you today. It'll be a quick, fast two hours. As we shared at the E3 conference, we've got our sponsors who are coming back to share even more ideas with you. I'm all about value add. I'm all about making sure your time is worth it to be with us when you are spending two hours, even if you might be in your funny slippers in front of the camera. But no matter what, we want to make sure that you, the time you spend with us is time well valued and well spent. So with that, I want to kick off our meeting. And again, the why is because we're virtual and I want to spend as much time as we can with you all and make sure that we stay connected and you'll see a lot more communication coming from us. The board is really excited to work with all of you. We're really excited to get going. We've got lots and lots of conversations going and things will continue to evolve as even the state evolves in terms of Corona and COVID and what's happening with it and how we're all operating together. So again, things will keep changing. We're really nimble. I said a moment ago as we were practicing, nimble wimble is what I called us. Uh, so just be with us and know that we're here lockstep with you. And with that, let me kick it over to Mr. Shane Westalter, past president of California. Good morning, everyone. Great to see everyone virtually. Uh, again, it'd be great if we could all get together live, but uh, certainly uh, appreciate you all being here. It is my uh, distinct privilege and honor to present Mimi with her gavel to get the official thing started here. So it's uh, been a pleasure to serve with Mimi, not only uh, at the local level, but on the state level. And uh, this is a, a long time coming. So congratulations, Mimi. We look forward to a great presidential year for you. And let me do this by handing off virtually the gavel to you. There you <laughs> go. <laughs> Thank you so much, Shane. This is great to have. I know that we're existing in this virtual world. Uh, we do happen to be six feet apart, but uh, close enough that we can have uh, the handoff of the gavel. So this was a special that I know the team behind the scenes really made this happen. So thank you so much, Shane, for being here and for uh, presenting me the gavel to officially start my year. So with that, uh, we are right at 10.03. And if you saw our agenda that was sent out at the one hour, we're about to start. Uh, we are on a tight schedule. Again, two hours will go really, really fast. So with that, let me hand over the screen time to Peter Buechler and his team, uh, who's be giving us an update around the advocacy that they're working on. They've got some great plans going on. And again, like I said, it's going to continue to evolve. So with that, Peter, let me hand this over to you. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Shane, for taking time out of your busy day to, to start our, our year off with that handoff of Mimi's gavel. Uh, I'm your past president. Uh, two years ago, I was the California president. I am incredibly proud to be in the new role as your government relations chair. You know, NAFA is a political action organization. And, and frankly, 
uh, as far as I'm concerned, I get a ton of value and, and it just relationships and friends and ideas. And it really helps my, my career in so many different ways. But our primary role is political, political activism. Uh, and I'm happy to take over this role from Mark Bregman, who did an incredible job as, as our GR chair for the last few years. He's actually now our secretary and will be a NAFA president in just a few years. But Mark did a, a great job of building the base uh, for our political activism and, and for me to take my new team and really execute some incredible activities uh, for this year. I'd like to introduce my team and you're gonna hear from them uh, each individually. But of course we have our, our state lobbyist, Sherry McHugh. Sherry has been our state lobbyist for 16 years. She actually started when she was 13. So we're very lucky to have her starting at such a young age and, and really has done an incredible job of building those relationships. And in fact, we are on first today because Sherry needs to actually go out and do some lobbying here shortly. So she is the face and the voice for NAFA California every day in the state capitol, in addition to our 33 national lobbyists, our federal lobbyists as well. Uh, in addition to Sherry, we also have our PAC chair, which is John Neilmeyer. John is a past president. He's going to talk to you a little bit about our PAC goals, the dollar side uh, of the political activism. And then our PIC chair is Trent uh, uh, Trent Bryson. Trent is uh, incredibly engaged and involved. In, and for those of you who know, PAC is the dollars, PIC is the activity. They're actually getting to know our lobbyists, getting to know our legislators, meeting with them, making those connections. And Trent himself has done an incredible job. He's actually a, a face on the news. You might see him on Channel 5. He's He's got a great relationship with our, our, our own uh, um, insurance commissioner, uh, insurance commissioner, Lara. Uh, and then to round out our group, we've got Michael Mattis. And Michael, uh, also an up and coming leader within NAFA California, past president of Los Angeles. But he came to us from the membership side and did an incredible job on the membership side. He's still connected with membership. And it's important because the membership connection and the political action connection are so importantly intertwined. The more members we have, the, the stronger our voice. And Mike's done an incredible job on membership. And I know he's gonna continue to do an incredible job on the political action side, which in on a local level, him and his father, Gil, uh, are just dynamos in that respect. So uh, I'm very excited about what our, our team's going to do this year. So with that, let me hand it over to Sherry. She's gonna give you some insights and bring on the rest of the team. Sherry. Great, thank you, Peter. Good morning, Nafa California. Uh, such a pleasure to be your advocate for so many years. Um, as many of you have heard me say over the years, it really is an honor to represent NAFA California, and I'm passionate about what all of you do in, as insurance agents and advisors in your various communities. And it's, it's like I said, an honor to be part of your organization and to represent all of you. Um, I am the eyes and ears for NAFA California in Sacramento. I am the one that is looking out for you and your businesses and your clients and your companies every day in Sacramento. Um, there are a lot of people that don't love some of the products that we sell don't appreciate some of the value that we bring. So sometimes, unfortunately, we have some bad ideas that we have to um, work against. I, will, I always like to point out the, the one that was most prominent in my career with all of you was the uh, suitability issue as it pertains to annuities and someone wanting to say that um, it is unsuitable to sell an annuity to anyone over the age of 65. Uh, we worked for years on that issue and that is just a really good example of of NAFA California playing defense and protecting um, all of you and your businesses and your products. An example of us being proactive and getting, getting uh, legislation passed is our work last year on AB5. We were one of the first professions amended into AB5 to exempt us from the Dynamex decision. It was imperative that we made sure that there was no confusion out there that insurance agents and advisors are indeed independent contractors. Uh, we worked very hard with labor to educate them about the distribution system and how we all work and how your businesses all work. And we were very successful in convincing them and the uh, Assemblywoman Gonzalez to put us into the bill to exempt us from the Dynamex decision. It was a huge victory. And as you know, many other professions are still trying to get that exemption, or I would say clarification. Um, I think you can see all the ads on TV. The gig economy is certainly one of them. So it's very present very uh, current and certainly one of the largest victories we've seen for NAFA California in many, many years. Um, we continue to um, you know, be bipartisan. We support Republicans and Democrats. That is how we were able to be successful in the AB5 space. Um, people like us, people understand what we do and it's because of the work that all of you are doing in your communities through the PAC, through the PIC, that we are able to make sure that we have friends on both sides of the aisle. 
Um, we definitely know that going into 2021, there's a lot of uncertainty what we might be faced with. Um, it's more important than ever to be an active member of NAFA California. We don't know what we might see on the taxation front. We don't know what we might see in the financial products space. Um, we just have a lot of uncertainty and we definitely need to be NAFA strong, um, as many members as we can possibly get, as strong as a pack as we can possibly get. Um, and of course, all of you active at the local level. So um, anything I can ever do to be of assistance to all of you as far as recruiting members or just you know sitting down and talking with folks, I'm happy to do so. Um, it is a honor, like I said, to represent NAFA California and I wanna do everything I can possible to make us NAFA California strong and to be as successful as we possibly can in Sacramento. Um, with that, I'll hand it off to John to uh, go a little more into detail on the importance of PAC. Thanks, Sherry. I appreciate uh, the words. Um, as Sherry said, I'm, my name is John Neilmeyer, past president of NAFA California and your current uh, IFA PAC chair. Uh, I'd like to start with a quote. I love quotes. Um, so it says, every man owes a part of his time and money to the business or industry in which he is engaged. No man has the moral right to withhold his support from an organization that is striving to improve conditions within his sphere. Uh, that was uh, quoted, that, that was by uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And I think it really personifies why um, NAFA exists and why I'm a NAFA member and why I'm a contributor to the political action committee, IFA PAC. Um, Oh, I think we all have a, a moral obligation and duty to give back to our industry so we can make sure that our, our clients are safe um, with the products and services that we, uh, we promise to them and our industries are safe for us as well. But um, um, so what is, for those of you who have, uh, are maybe newer to uh, NAFA, uh, PAC is, uh, stands for the, well, IFA PAC stands for Insurance and Financial Advisors Political Action Committee and it's our ability to actually fund uh, legislators campaigns both federal and state um, basically fund legislators from key positions and also legislators who understand the benefit and importance that we uh, we give to our our clients every day and it's with those political contributions that we're able to garner these relationships so outside of what Trent's going to talk about uh, in a few minutes uh, on the political involvement side they're kind of intertwined to a degree um, we can't get into see these uh, these political figures necessarily without uh, without um, you know, some of those contributions that we give. So it's an incredibly important part of what we do um, through NAFA California in our advocacy efforts. So some of the things that we're trying to accomplish this year, um, we got basically three months left, a little less than three months now. Um, our overall IFPAC goal was $110,000. Uh, we're right at $80,000 currently. So we have a few more, more months to kind of bring it home. I'm hoping some of you are gonna give your year-end uh, contributions pretty quick here. Um, so um, the other, other goal was, of course, our participation goal. So we're trying to get to 30%. And this is a really important part of uh, our goals because as you see the grain of NAFA, the grain of, grain of the industry, some people are you know, leaving the business, they're retiring. And quite frankly, some of these folks have been giving you know, very generously throughout the years. Uh, and we can't always count on them. And you know, rightfully so. At some point, people are gonna retire and, and they have a right to, to stop contributing. So, uh, they've been carrying the water for a long time, and I think it's time that we, you know, uh, carry that that weight. Uh, as uh, Michael Morris used to always say, membership, many hands make for light work. Um, you know, when you break down, our goals are very, very easy to obtain when you think about it. Uh, $110,000 uh, of contributions needed divided by our membership. It's only $70 a year per member, uh, six and a half, seven dollars a month. Uh, so I ask everyone, you know, if, you're, if you made this industry a career of yours, who can't give six and a half to seven dollars a month? to make sure that we reach our goals um, as a as a organization through our pack so please keep that in mind um, and quite frankly it's very easy to give now um, i know some of you who are who've been um, uneasy with the website uh, the website has been redone you simply go to nefa.org go to the advocacy action center uh, log in only with your email address that's all you need you don't need to log in uh, nefa id number anymore and you can actually give right right there on the website if if you're more um, if you're more in tune with the old paper method, let me know. Um, let one of our executives on the team know and, and we'll send you a, a uh, form to do that. But um, um, so, so we got tons of resources here too. We got uh, uh, templates that we can send out an email for your, your locals um, and um, we've got some videos to share. So please hit us up, let us know how we can help. But um, 
again, it's a very important part of what we do. It's 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 all kind of uh, goes together with what Sherry just mentioned and what Trent's going to mention next. Uh, very important cog in the advocacy machine. So um, we appreciate your time and we appreciate your contributions as well. And with that, I'll give it to uh, with Trent. Thanks, Sean. Hey, everyone. Um, as I mentioned, my job as the pick chair is, is really focused on two things. Um, one is relationships and, uh, and two is, is membership in the right in every district. So um, right now we have actually two really important needs. Um, Eduardo Garcia in the 56th district, which is in the Coachella Valley area, and Mike Gibson in the 64th, which is in the Carson Wilmington area, um, are two districts that we don't have a member in. Um, NAFA on a national level has like 99% participation um, in districts. Those two districts to not have a member in is a, is a big glaring uh-oh for us. So I need everybody um, listening on this call to think of, your, think of anybody within any of your organizations or any affiliations and, and kind of think about if there's anybody you know in the Coachella Valley or the Wilmington Carson area and how we can get them to A, join NAFA and then to create relationships. The second is the relationship side, which I, I think is the most enjoyable part of, of my job, which is forming these long lasting relationships. Um, and it doesn't always have to be, you know, if somebody's a Republican or a Democrat, the reality is in California um, is for us to only support red doesn't make sense for us because there's a lot of moderate Democrats that go to battle for us on a daily basis. So. I think that while we look at some races and we think, oh, there's, why are we supporting that person? I think it's really important for us to remember that um, there are a lot of moderates on both sides that can help us out. And those relationships are really important for us. Um, for me, I had a relationship with our local uh, state assemblyman, which was Ricardo Lara. He happened to go on and be the insurance commissioner. So pretty critical um, for him to go on and do that and for us to have that relationship pretty early on in his career. Um, now his replacement, Lena Gonzalez, is here and we're working everything from, we were donating PPE equipment when this pandemic came out to reaching out and saying, hey, I'm here for you on any insurance related uh, issues. She's the one that put forth the HIV um, uh, policy that, and it was me that reached out and said, hey, on these kind of questions, can you help, can I help you and can I be a resource for you? And the more we are at the table and having those conversations, the better off we are. So I really encourage you to not only just be a part of NAFA, but to create those relationships with um, your state assemblymen, senators. Um, that becomes probably the most important thing that we do um, on the activism side. So on that, I'm gonna turn it over though. Um, thanks everyone. Hi everyone, uh, this is Michael Maris, um, part of the advocacy team for NAFA California, and wanted to just point out and amplify what Trent was mentioning about the opportunities to have advisors in those two specific areas. But we, we also wanna build relationships with our Congress people as well. So those people get elected every two years and we wanna build those relationships with them as well. So in addition to uh, fostering membership, we want to build relationships. And those relationships, as Trent mentioned, uh, are key and crucial to sharing our message to uh, the legislators. They get asked a lot of different uh, questions when they're legislators to put on legislation that ends up being uh, potentially detrimental to their own constituents. And we're there to tell the stories, to tell how products and services positively impact their communities and their constituents. And um, we focused a lot about state involvement, but we also want to get involved uh, with the federal side as well with our Congress people. We've got 50 plus Congress people in our state and we want to make sure we have relationships with each one. And these relationships, as we've discussed, are what make NAFA unique. And unlike any other financial service uh, organization, in, in, in the industry. And what I mean by that is that we have the ability to go and meet with legislators on both the state and local level to share our story. So whether it's a Congresswoman on the House Ways and Means Committee like Judy Chu, or it's a, uh, the chair of the Insurance Commission, Susan Rubio, uh, 
on the state Senate side. Those are relationships we have and continue to cultivate um, throughout the state. So our ask is to uh, help us with those areas, as Trent mentioned, that include the Coachella Valley and the Carson, Wilmington, uh, Compton area. So if anyone knows any advisors in that area, please reach out to me or Trent or the government relations team. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Hey, a couple quick things uh, uh, to remind you of. You know, Sherry, Sherry mentioned something that happened, that the, the Scott bill, uh, that really Sherry was instrumental in, in making it as available to sell annuities to seniors. Seems sort of silly that we would have to fight for that. Something else that we had a huge win on was AB5. So if you're watching the, the elections right now, they're trying to get Uber drivers the ability to work as independent contractors. Had Sherry and Nathan not done the legwork years ago and fought in AB5 and got a carve out for insurance agents, we would be dealing with that same issue where we would, insurance agents, the, the epitome of independent uh, advisors would be forced to uh, become employees. Uh, in addition, a um, couple of things that I want you to keep in mind. You, if you want to know how to get inv involved and engaged on the political involvement side, we've got the virtual engagement raffle. And that's going on right now. It's a really neat opportunity for you to get engaged and involved in a virtual way. There's 27 different activities that you can do from the, the comfort of your home. And for each activity you do, you get a raffle pro you get a raffle ticket. And we have some really great raffle prizes, an iPod, and I, I, uh, uh, some ear pods, and some other cool stuff as well. Finally, we're going to, or not finally, we're also going to have another call, an election wrap-up call on November 19th. Uh, I believe, excuse me, let me double check the date. I believe it's uh, no, November, excuse me, 17th uh, at 2 p.m. So that wrap-up call is going to be with Sherry McHugh as well as our federal lobbyists. And, and you as NAFA members are going to get some insights on what just happened and what does this mean for our industry. It's going to be a very important call. And along with that call, we're going to have a special event specifically for PAC contributors. So if you're not contributing to PAC in some capacity, you want to start doing that. You know, being a NAFA member is incredibly important. Getting your dollars in there for PAC contributions is incredibly important as well. And getting involved in the political involvement side is incredibly important. You can do it virtually. And then we can also do it with Day on the Hill, which we are going to have a Day on the Hill, which is going to be March 24th. So more detail on all this stuff to come. Um, but thank you all for being members and thank you for paying attention uh, for what I think is one of the most important activities we do, which is our political involvement. So thank you. Mimi, back to you. Thank you, Peter. Always so excellent in terms of information and enthusiasm about advocacy. Um, I'll circle back to that a little bit later, so I won't take too much time away from Shane Westholter, who I'll be introducing now. Shane is um, going to be sharing a, a great sales idea. If you've ever seen him speak on stage, you just get really motivated by listening to him. So be sure you got your pen and paper out and be sure to get ready to take some good notes. So Shane, thank you so much for being with us and being a sponsor of our meeting. And let me hand it over to you. Thank you, Mimi. Hey, everyone. Great to see you. See, we all leave one by default or by design, so let's help you do it by design. That's kind of our tag and our brand and our, our focus. Over the last couple of years, we've also added in a, a unique twist to that, and that is that we don't do insurance and we don't do financial planning exclusively. What we do is provide dignity for people when it matters most. And uh, that came about from a, a short story that started in my career back in, the, in St. Louis when I was going door to door in Ferguson, Missouri and selling $5,000, $10,000 life insurance policies door to door and then having to go back every month and collect those premiums. Uh, they, they called it debit agent back in the day. Now I think it's a service agent or some other name that's more politically correct. However, that being said, something happened about 90 days into my career after getting my license. I was uh, going to make collections and my manager came to me and said, I need you to deliver this $10,000 check to one of the clients on your route. And so I took that $10,000 check out to a mother who had just lost her seven-year-old son in a drive-by shooting. To sit down with a mother who had lost a seven-year-old son in a drive-by shooting was devastating for me. I could not imagine what it would be like to lose a seven-year-old son, especially in a drive-by shooting. So we talked, we reminisced, we cried, we talked about all of the things of her son's life that brought her happiness and joy. Then she said something to me that made me a believer in this industry and why I'm still in it today after 30 plus years. 
She said, Mr. Shane, this $10,000 check may not be a lot of money to you or to many, but to me, it affords me the ability not to ask my family, my friends, or my church for the money that I need to give my son the decency he deserves. So thank you, Mr. Shane, for helping me keep my dignity. This $10,000 check allows me to keep my dignity and give my son the decency he deserves. Think about what we do in this industry. Each one of us professionally as financial professionals are there when people need us most, either for the plan or the unexpected. So we help people plan for the expected. We help people plan for the unexpected. We bring people dignity when it matters most. Today, I wanna to share with you a few short sales ideas. And one of the things that I see us doing uh, in this economy, and especially over the last uh, couple of years is the industry is trending from being a one-time purchase to a subscription model thinking. So I wanna move us from membership economy to membership community. And what I mean by that is, how do we move our clients from buying products from us and being part of even a subscription model to being part of our every day, every week, every month community? Uh, we're moving from a one-time product service to membership purchases, right? To a service model. Think about it, when you go to the gym, you no longer buy a one-time gym membership, which is a once and done. You buy a monthly membership. And the monthly memberships are now evolving so that that monthly membership allows you not only to pay monthly, but it allows you to use any gym that's within their network around the country, right? So it's this service model that says, I'm going to pay a membership fee and I get all these value added benefits. And of course, in a gym membership, as many of us would know, that allows us to pick a gym maybe in our area. And then if you're traveling or out and about, find a gym that's in that same network of uh, providers. So that being said, there's also a mentality change that has happened. And I believe that people have gotten to a point to where they don't want to buy a one-time purchase. It's a big commitment. It means I have to really think about what I'm doing and there's no turning back. That was that hard sell that many of us in the industry over the years had to overcome. We called it buyer's remorse. After they made that purchase, did they feel bad about making it? So we had to make sure we followed up quickly so they didn't have buyer's remorse. Think about a monthly subscription model. You don't get buyer's remorse. You can cancel at any time. There's no long-term commitments. We do it with things like Netflix or Amazon or Amazon Prime or gym memberships. A lot of times going in to purchase a car, even though you set it up on monthly payments is a big time purchase. What if they said you can lease it and then just convert it to ownership at the end of your lease if you like. People are gravitating to the, that way of thinking. How do we move our industry to that same place? What can we do to create a, a, a mental change from a one-time purchase to a subscription or a fee, uh, a fee model? People are very comfortable buying membership fees. Make no mistake about it. If you can write a newsletter and your firm allows you to charge for that newsletter, um, I know not many of our advisors are now putting out a monthly newsletter that they write. They send it out virtually via email. And that virtual email subscription for their newsletter is $19.95 a month, $19.95 a month. It's just a membership fee to get their monthly newsletter. Whether they're a client, they have assets under management, or whether they have purchased insurance products or not, they are getting subscribers who are subscribing to their 1995 newsletter every month. Think about it, 1995 times 300 subscribers is 5,980, uh, I'm sorry, $5,985 a month, almost $6,000 a month just to write a newsletter. So think about how you can leverage yourself into subscriptions. Maybe say, Shane, 1995 is too much for a monthly subscription. That's fine, and start getting you know, $6,000 a month. What if you broke that down and only got $3,000 a month, charge half the price? So you figure out how to move towards a subscription model. Another thing that we're doing uh, in our organization is videos. You know, with virtual meetings like this and Zoom, people are getting much more comfortable, obviously, with virtual meetings and using technology. And of course, everyone likes videos. I uh, can, can't think about how many times I've seen on Facebook postings, all right, I've exhausted my Netflix subscription. I've watched every video I can possibly watch. So videos are something that people like, they enjoy, regardless of what that video is. Don't feel like you have to be movie star, LA, high level, postscript, edited down version of a professional video. People like reality. So one of the things we started doing, and we started this on the property casualty side, is sending out a video that explains their property 
uh, and auto and home insurance. And that allows us to go through all of the details, kind of like what I'm doing here in a presentation, only it would be a recorded video. You record the benefits. Why does it cost what it costs? What are the savings that we can save you? Let's do a side by side compare and then show you the value added benefits. You send that out as a maybe a three to five minute video clip. The client gets to watch it. And then at the end of the clip, you basically say, and we'll be following up with you in a couple of days to answer any questions that you might have after you've had time to watch this video. Think about the meeting before the meeting, as we would say. This gives them the opportunity at their leisure to absorb that information, think about the information, come up with questions they might have, and then you can have that live phone call or that time with them to be able to uh, coordinate and go for the close of the sale. The other thing that you can do is translate that over into the financial services or insurance. What if we're buying long-term care insurance? What if we're buying disability? What if we're buying annuities? What about life insurance? Can you take the time to explain to them in a video the difference between term universal life, urban universal life, whole life, and et cetera, in a short, concise way so that they have the information they need, because we all love information, then they can listen to what you're proposing and why you're proposing it, and they feel like they've got that knowledge now to make a real decision. So again, how do you move into the modern day with some of these ideas? Um, we have started doing a podcast. So podcasting uh, every month. And one of the things that you can do in your subscription model is charge for those podcasts. So let's say that a client subscribes to your monthly subscription. One of the value adds is they're going to get a podcast. In a podcast, you get the right to basically share with them the same as like a radio interview or if you were sitting with them. And then I want to take it one step further. In the podcast, not only can you charge for your podcasts, you can archive them, of course, create your own YouTube channel, uh, which we've done, the Gateway YouTube channel now. And then you can move that into interviewing your clients. You know, we have a very unique position in that we work with all different types of clients, right? From Main Street to Wall Street, from small business owners to medium-sized business owners. Some of you work with large business owners. Maybe you're in the foundations, the 403B, working with teachers and doctors or hospitals. Think about the power that you have to network people together. Here's an idea. What if you did a podcast where you're interviewing your clients so that they can talk about themselves, about their business, about the things that they can bring forward, and then you put that out through your social media networks and broadcast that to all of your client base. So now the mechanic or the hair salon or the restaurant or whatever has the ability to use you almost like a mini B2B where we all got together and wanted to exchange business cards and meet other professionals to see if we can maybe service each other, be of value to each other, refer each other, you become the key person that puts all of that together. That's priceless. There are organizations and business owners and people that will pay to have you be that podcast networker, if you will, almost like a live B2B or a virtual B2B. And then don't forget about your sponsors. Bring your sponsors in and let them provide content. So whether you're using marketing library, real wealth marketing, um, whether you're using some of your sponsor materials, creating the material yourself, there's a lot of ways that you can bring content and information to your clients. But the key that I wanna leave you with, with all of this is when you bring it to your clients, stop doing it for free. Nothing is for free. As I say in my office and I teach our staff on a regular basis, I'm happy to do that at my expense. Anytime that we give up our time, anytime that we do research, we provide content, material, newsletters, research material that we bring to them, even if it's in you know, a prospectus or a background information, it costs you to bring that information. So stop saying, I'm going to do this for free. Start using the phrase, I'm going to do this at my expense. So thank you, Mr. and Mrs. Client. I appreciate you having your assets here. If you would like to subscribe to my monthly subscription, it's $19.95 a month. With that, you'll get a monthly newsletter, you'll get a monthly podcast. I will bring you content that's specific to you. It's customized to your needs, to your interests, and that's key there. Personalization is key. So make it customized and personalized just for them. And then look at some of the technology that's out there. Let me close with this. Look at Clips app, C-L-I-P-S app. What the Clips app does is by adding that as an app, when you do a video, it actually takes what you're saying and translates it into text and puts it up like closed caption, if you will, on the video. So people can read it as well as hear it when you're speaking it. Uh, write a lot of articles and put them out on Google. 
I mean, do articles that may or may not just be product driven. It could be something like, if you wonder if you could get disability insurance, write an article. If you want to know the difference between variable annuities, fixed annuities, write an article. When you write those articles, you put them out there. When people Google search for information, that article could come up. And if that article comes up, then point them, of course, in your article back to your website, how to contact you for additional information. And I want to challenge you to go out of the box. What if you just said, does putting in solar make sense to save money? When does it make sense to buy a car versus lease a car? When does it make sense to refinance your, your mortgage loan? If you don't have the expertise or the knowledge or the uh, compliance approval to put that out yourself, bring experts in and interview them and let them write the article. You put it out under your name as an interview with that client or that mortgage lender or that specialist. Again, great ways to build your network, use your client's expertise to make yourself out there visibly in the social media. And last but not least, look at Nextmo app. That's N-E-X-T. MO app, Nextmo app, it's a voice command app that allows you to add that to your website. So when clients come to your website, instead of point and click and search and find, they, ver they basically can use their voice command to find things on your website. So Nextmo is a great uh, voice command app that you can add to navigate through your website. So thank you again, Nathan, California. Appreciate all of you. Uh, love to see all of you again live uh, soon. Thank you for allowing us to be a uh, sponsorship. Mimi, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you to continue the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Shane. Oh, my gosh. Do you guys feel like you just had a fire hose? A ton of great ideas. Hopefully, you were scribbling like mad um, and got some great ideas to take back to use in your practice today at, at noon when we're done here today. Um, do you like my new background? 130 years. NAFA, we're celebrating 130 years. So, all right. Without further ado, we are going to go right into our next section. Now you're going to hear from one of our board members, Jason Foster, who is heading up the membership team. I'll explain teams a little bit later when I go through my commentary a little bit later today. But Jason um, has been serving on the, NA uh, the state board for many years. You'll have to tell us how many years. I think it's been probably close to five years now. Uh, but Jason brings a lot of enthusiasm in terms of everything that he does. So I'm so excited to see where membership will go. Michael Mares was his uh, predecessor and, uh, of course, a great teacher, too. And so he'll, you'll be hearing from both Michael and Jason in just a moment here. So with that, Jason, let me hand it over to you. Perfect. Thanks, Mimi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jason. You're on Hoff. mute. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, no. Jason, you're all good. I, I'm unmuted. Hmm. Uh... Nobody can hear me? Uh, yep. No, we can hear you, Jason. You can hear me? Yep, we can hear you. You're good. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Just Mimi can't hear me, I think. Okay. I don't. All right, guys. Good morning. Sorry. Good old technical difficulties. I did unmute myself. But uh, anyway, I appreciate uh, um, the, the leeway in there, Mimi. Uh, my name is Jason Foster. I'm your 2021 membership chair. And uh, lots of exciting things uh, in the works for us this coming year. Um, Mike, as, as Mimi mentioned, uh, Michael Mars is on my team, uh, as well as Rich Coffin, and uh, I'm basically just picking up right where Michael left off last year. Just to kind of give you a quick overview of where we're at today, uh, we're sitting at about 1,370 members, and uh, which, is, which puts us in third in the country, right behind Texas and Florida. Um, as you guys know, I'm pretty competitive, so uh, I'll be gunning for those states uh, pretty hard this year, and I think that we could. Uh, I think we could pass them uh, with with some of the good stuff that we have going on for sure. Um, just kind of give you an update on where you know, as far as like what what's coming up. Uh, I guess fourth quarter here uh, for membership and driving membership. We're planning on hosting a two part event uh, coming out uh, starting starting November nineteenth. We are going to be hosting a field sales leader forum. This would be for all GAs and managers or just leadership in general uh, within, within the company. So uh, I, what I'm gonna ask is if you guys know managers, names, uh, GAs, send those in to us, please. We wanna make sure all everybody's invited uh, throughout the state for that, for that event. We'll be following that event up. Like I mentioned, it's a two-part series. Uh, with a event December 1st. We have uh, Dave McKnight 
will be a present uh, be doing a presentation. Uh, this will be for members and non-members, and hopefully we could push uh, uh, as many as many people as we can to that event. But I think you know overall with with those two with those two things going. The one thing we've been missing a lot and we, we've kind of figured it out is, you know, we're missing kind of that field uh, leadership, that middle, the middle managers there. And so what we're trying to do is just uh, we're trying to bring them back in and, and get, get their support. But more importantly, what can we do for, for them, not what can they do for us um, and how can, how can NAPA help them and their agencies uh, and their producers. And so we want to try to give back as much as we can. And so I'm, I am just kind of outreach right now, asking if you guys know a, a sales manager, GAs, anybody, send those names in to us, please, because we want to make sure they're at that event on November 19th. Um, so with that being said, uh, let's see, you know, one thing that Michael did a really good job and uh, Rich and myself last year with some meetings as we could, uh, and that's one of the things that we're, we're going to try to outreach again and continue to push our agency meetings, uh, just trying to get 10, 15 minutes on the agenda to discuss NAPA, the benefits of NAPA, how can NAPA benefit you guys. Um, so if you guys know of events and things that are happening within your companies, please let us know so we could uh, try, to, try to get on the agenda there. Um, we do have a new due structure and I'm going to turn this over to uh, Michael here to kind of discuss uh, that piece. And so uh, let me just share that, Mike. There we go. So Michael, I'm going to turn it yes. over to you. All right, great. Thank you, Jason. So I, I've been asked to just highlight the graduated due structure that NAFA has um, set up to help grow NAFA. Um, as Shane was talking about, this is uh, similar to a subscription model. You know, we want people to uh, try out NAFA and it's, we've really lowered the bar in terms of cost and making it accessible. And as we've highlighted in the meeting so far, NAFA is truly a career insurance and it's a way to protect the products and services that we provide our clients on a daily basis. So if you're brand new to NAFA, um, never been a member before, but have some experience in the industry, then the membership is, is $30. That's $30 per month. It's called a graduated dues structure because each year the cost will increase and you'll step up to the next level. Um, Similarly, if you are brand new to the industry, um, newly licensed, you can be a member for as little as $10 a month. So those are the people that you want to bring on who um, are maybe new to the business, maybe new to your company that you can bring along and share with them the value that NAFA provides. Similarly, if they're in the second year, it's $20. As you can see on the other side, for more experienced people, year four, $40 year five, $50, and eventually you'll level up to the uh, $55, $56 per month that all of us pay for membership. I always like to compare things to things in our business, and this is like graduated premium on disability insurance. It gets a little bit more expensive year after year, but hopefully you'll begin to find more and more value with this. So people can um, very easily how much it costs to be a NAFA member. Before in the past, there were some questions about what's it cost for this local or that local. Well, it's all the same. We've levelized the dues. This is the same, same rate as you'd find across the country. And there's an easy website, uh, nafa.org forward slash join. So our call to action here today is to each one reach one, to reach out to someone, a friend, a colleague. We all know people in the business. And as Jason said, we're both competitive and we want to see our state continue to grow. And there's no reason that California should be behind Florida or Texas. We, we have the opportunity to grow. And with the strategies that we put together as a membership team and along with the local and affiliate membership chairs, we will have a successful year. So with that, Jason. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Um, 
so anyway, guys, I, I, I just to kind of close up real quick, we, uh, we're, we're super excited for this new year. Um, like I mentioned, we're, we are competitive and we, we do want to beat those guys, but more importantly, we just want to grow and bring value uh, back to our members. And so that's, uh, that's, that's kind of the first order of business. And again, November 19th, that will be, a, that'll be for sales leaders, uh, GAs, uh, and, and just leadership in general. So uh, please, uh, please write that day down. More, more to come on it, more details to come on that, but uh, super excited to start, start the year off or start kind of the, the whole um, kickoff here with, with that event coming up. So with that, um, I think, Peter, you're back, you're up. I believe I am, yeah. Let's see here, is my audio on, I hope, yep. Okay, good. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, now let's see here. How's my screen looking? And do we have the right screen on or am I on the wrong screen? You're all set. Okay, good. Well, okay. thank you. Yeah, good, good, good. Thank you. Thank you. And actually, and now I'm talking in my capacity as a uh, NAFA, NAFA California sponsor, which I'm very proud to be. Uh, obviously, I support what we do as, a, as an organization. And it's I'm happy to put uh, my dollars behind that as well. And hopefully share a couple of ideas and some insights in my presentation. This is a pared down presentation of my top tens. And what I've done is I've taken the, the top three of those top 10 fixed sales ideas, uh, planning mistakes and how to avoid them, as well as some competitive products that are in the marketplace today. So with that, let's get started. Uh, disclosure, this is not for public distribution. There's tax and, and legal questions that may come up. I'm going to share my insights, but ultimately the answer to those questions is whatever your tax or financial advisor shares, or, or your tax or legal advisor, I should say. Our agenda, annuities are powerful tools. Uh, they mean a number of client needs, uh, but like anything powerful and, and uh, they're, any area that's complicated, if you aren't careful, you can trip up. Uh, and the best product for your client uh, as we talk about, you know, hot products is the product that fits your client's unique needs and situations. Um, you know, a little bit about cohesive insurance services. I've started cohesive insurance services about nine years ago, and we're a lifelong to cure annuity and disability income wholesale organization, field marketing organization. However, my main focus is, um, is in the annuity space. Um, so with that, um, let's talk about some annuity planning mistakes. Um, and how to avoid them. One mistake that I see a lot of clients making is not capturing an annuity's issue date. Um, and there's a couple of reasons why this is important. And obviously when you're, when you're working with clients, fact finding is an incredibly important part of that um, client relationship. So identifying all of their assets uh, and really some of the, the dates on when they uh, um, gathered those assets. So one, what's the significance? When fact finding, be sure to accurately, ca accurately capture the annuity issue date. One day's difference can make a huge difference for your clients uh, and the IRS. And I'll show you some specific uh, instances where that matters. Uh, uh, and when I say capturing the issue date, clients have oftentimes have annuities that they have moved 1035 from other annuities. So if a client has an annuity, you might ask uh, him or her, you know, where did those assets come from initially to, to issue that annuity contract? Um, and all of this information is, is typically located in section 72 of the IRC code. And at various points in time, Congress has changed the rules in governing how annuities are taxed. So it's important to recognize that not all annuities are created equal in the eyes of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, and we'll take a look at a couple of examples with that. Uh, a couple of important dates are, are one for annuities that were issued prior to uh, August 14th, 1982. And these annuities get FIFO treatment and are not subject to the 10% premature distribution penalty. So now 1982 is a while back ago. I can't imagine a lot of clients have held a contract from 1982, that same contract, but they may very well have uh, rolled that contract or 1035 that contract into a new annuity contract. So that's why it's important to identify when was the initial annuity uh, issued from uh, where those your current annuity dollars are at. And if they don't know that, and oftentimes clients won't know that, um, the, uh, the, the insurance carrier will know that. 
Um, so you can actually call the insurance carrier and identify what was the initial issue date on the basis of those annuity contracts. And, and what is the difference on this FIFO and LIFO treatment? Well, FIFO treatment is first in, first out tax treatment. So the first money that goes into a contract, let's say a non-qualified annuity contract that has gain, the first money that went into that contract was the basis. So if you withdraw from those types of annuity contracts issued prior to August 14th, 82, you would get your basis out first, and then you would get the, the taxable gain out. For contracts issued past 19, that date in 1982, they would have LIFO treatment, meaning the gain would come out first. And with the gain coming out first, they're obviously going to have a taxable event and a potential penalty uh, on any of those, those withdrawals that they take out. And the same goes for gifting an annuity issued past April 22nd, 87. Uh, those, those annuities when gifted, result in taxable gain for the policy owner. And then for those after that date, uh, it is not taxable to the policy owner, but rather to the person receiving the gift. Something else that, that comes up um, oftentimes that I see is owner and beneficiary mistakes. And one of those is making minors owners and or beneficiaries of annuities. And the main issue is that minors don't have the legal capacity to contract uh, and to exercise a contract. They can't exercise policy ownership rights. They can't they cannot annuitize, they can't make withdrawals. Uh, so really the solution in this instance is to make sure either all the kids or grandkids are over the age of majority or using an UTMA or UGMA type account. Um, and the reason that, that with that UTMA or UGMA type account, um, you're gonna have a, a, a guardian or a, really it's a, it's a, a, a trustee for that account and they'll be able to act in, in the capacity to assist on those annuity contracts. However, unlike uh, a, 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 a guardian type of situation, if a, a, a custodian on an UTMA account misuses those funds, that minor actually has legal recourse uh, to get to, to against that person who misused those funds. You know, something else that we see a lot of people making a mistake on is having trusts own the annuities. Now, a trust can own an annuity without losing the tax deferred buildup, but it's got to be the, an instance in where the trust is really a nominal owner and the natural person, uh, the, the annuitant typically, is the beneficial owner. Uh, is a natural, is an actual natural person. So when you have living trust, can a living trust own an annuity contract, uh, which is typically what we see? Yes, it can. It can still retain that tax deferred buildup. But one of the issues that you run into is you run into some of the, uh, you, you run into some limitations as far as what can happen at the death of the annuitant. Uh, with annuities, one of the great things about annuities is that Oftentimes you can continue, the beneficiary can continue an annuity contract over their lifetime should they choose to. But if you have a trust as a beneficiary or a trust as an owner of an annuity contract, some carriers will not allow you to continue that or that beneficiary to continue that annuity contract over that lifetime. Even if the beneficiary uh, of the trust is a natural person, sometimes the carrier will say, well, it's a non-natural beneficiary, even though the beneficiary of the trust ultimately is a natural person, uh, we're not going to do a look through. In other instances, if we do have the beneficiary of, a, of an annuity as a trust, and let's say uh, a child is, or, 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 or there is a natural beneficiary that's the sole beneficiary of that trust, sometimes the carrier will actually say, well, we see the trust as the beneficiary, but we're gonna go ahead and look through that trust and let this natural person beneficiary of the trust uh, take advantage of wh whether it's a continuation of the annuity or an income payout over their lifetime. There's any number of benefits that they can take advantage of. The long and the short of it is if you have a trust involved, it's more often than not, it's going to create some, some issues. Now, if you've got a special needs kid or you've got some other issues or you want to spread it out amongst multiple non-natural entities, a client wants to spread benefit payouts over non-natural entities, in, in those instances, sometimes a trust may make sense. Same thing with the corporate owned annuity. Uh, back in 1986, Congress changed the laws in that a non-natural entity such as a corporation or an LLC 
will not have that tax deferred growth in an annuity contract. This is separate from an annuity contract held within a qualified retirement plan, which would be tax deferred. Um, but a traditional non-qualified annuity, uh, an, a corporation owning that annuity, they could get a 1099. Now, also that, that may be the case with a partnership situation as well, even though technically two partnerships is really two individuals. Um, however, or two or more individuals, I should say. Um, however, in, in the instance of corporate owned annuities, they do lose their tax deferred buildup. But in some instances, especially for long term corporate dollars, annuities still can be an attractive uh, accumulation vehicle, even though there's uh, a, 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 they don't have that tax deferred aspect. Uh, and then mistake number three is failing to understand the protections uh, that annuities offer, whether it's credit protection uh, and the solvency guarantees of annuities. And credit exposure, it's a concern for many clients. Many states have statutes dealing with how much of an annuity, if any, is exempt from the claims of creditors, uh, bankruptcy or both. Uh, that, that goes for the annuity cash value, as well as that annuity income payments. And I think of the, the most famous example of this is the O.J. Simpson situation. It's a sad situation. Um, and and uh, Mr. Goldblum or uh, uh, Goldman, Mr. Goldman won, I think, a $30 million verdict against O.J. Simpson. But unfortunately, the bulk of O.J. Simpson's assets are held in his NFL pension, which is an annuity, uh, which cannot be attached uh, by that creditor for that uh, for that claim. Um, so it's a sad situation. But it, in that instance, it shows an, uh, how an annuity, again, really uh, uh, kept those assets from uh, his creditor uh, attaching those assets. In few states, there's exemptions, it's unlimited, uh, and some have a cap, but, and it can be pretty low. But bottom line, annuities, they can be a strong asset protection vehicle in some states. Um, so something to keep in mind. Uh, also, the, the forgetting about state guarantee associations. Now, we cannot use the state guarantee associations as an enticement to buy an annuity contract, but it is available in all states, 50 states in Puerto Rico. It's collected from assessments doing business from carriers doing business in the state. It's actually not the state or the federal government covering that guarantee. It's the different carriers in that uh, state doing business and, and it's uh, protect. Some of them will protect only policyholders living in the state. California, it's any policy that's issued in that state. It's a limited uh, up to $250,000 of cash value, 80% of the account value up to $250,000. Uh, is the cash value. So that is the, uh, and that information is available at the NOLHG. I believe that's the Association of the Health and Guarantee Associations. Um, so you can take a look at that at their website. So a uh, couple things to keep in mind. I think the, the main issue when it comes to mistakes when within annuity planning, a lot of it is not gathering and doing good fact finding. So good fact finding, asking questions, identifying what they have, uh, I think is real helpful. Here's a couple of things that I've seen really Positive, really popular right now as far as in the annuity planning space, some some really competitive or, or some some attractive sales ideas. And, and the one that I'm seeing more and more is as we see more and more people nearing at or near retirement is is guaranteed income planning. And, and what I've, you know, in the past we've seen clients go, well, how much money do I need to have at retirement? And it's 2 million or 3 million or some huge number that's really daunting. Uh, to clients. And, and really what we want to do is remove the fear of that number. And that's where income gap planning comes in. And what income gap planning does is it integrates all income sources, uh, guaranteed income sources uh, from that client and identifies the gaps between their guaranteed income sources and their, their absolute income requirements. So in that instance, we're going to look at social security, we're going to look at uh, the pension monies or other guaranteed income sources that they have. And what we do is we identify where there is a gap. Where's the gap from what they have guaranteed coming in to what they, uh, what they actually uh, need coming in. And it's a lot more manageable of a number. And it can give them hope that, hey, we can reach this retirement goal. We, we do have enough assets. Excuse me. We do have enough assets uh, to meet this. And I have a number of tools, whether it's pre-approach letters or scripts, or I have a great income gap fact finder uh, and Social Security income planning assistance to help you help them understand what their guaranteed income sources are uh, with Social Security. And then, of course, uh, guaranteed income uh, com uh, guaranteed income comparison and planning tools. Uh, number two sales ideas seem simple, but there's so many different areas that this can, can be successful. Policy review. One, it's easy to do remotely. And, and when I say remotely, how I assist brokers with doing policy review, whether it's a policy that they helped issue 
or, or whether it's a, a contract that was issued prior to that relationship or something that did outside the scope of that relationship, I like to involve the client. And we'll do a conference call with the client. So the client's there hearing the questions, hearing the insights, hearing, you know, all the things that we're trying to identify on is this uh, an appropriate contract or can it be improved or what are the benefits and how do we best execute these benefits? Uh, if not, you can always get a letter of authority or access for that client. And really what you're looking at is, is you're looking at what, you know, when was this issued, right? We talked about the issue dates. What was the initial, the original 1035? Where'd it come from? You know, what are the current rates, caps? What are the minimums on this contract? I'll tell you some of these older contracts, you know, unfortunately it doesn't always create a sale opportunity, but it's important to understand sometimes you've got clients that have older contracts, minimum guarantees are three, 4%. Those are contracts we don't want to do anything with other than maybe try to put some more money in them if we can. Uh, big part is beneficiary. Beneficiary review. We talked about trust or minors owning beneficiaries. I mean, some of us have heard the stories of, I have a personal story of a friend of mine whose uh, ex-wife received the uh, income payouts from uh, her former spouse and the current wife who was left off as beneficiary was sort of left out in the cold. So um, that's really important. You know, also what was the intent of that policy? Why do we buy that annuity contract? Was this for income? Was it for accumulation? Things change. Uh, something else that comes up a lot with policy review, again, especially on older contracts, and especially when we're looking at doing an income planning scenario, some old annuity contracts have very competitive minimum annuitization rates. So you want to make sure that before you make any change on any policy, we really exhaust every aspect and review every aspect of that policy. And then of course, carrier ratings. I wouldn't necessarily move a policy from one carrier to another just because a carrier was more highly rated. Um, but all things being equal, we wanna take all that into account uh, as well. You know, along with policy review, there's variable policy review. And now this is really for variable license reps only. Um, however, there's nothing to keep your client from, you know, having a conversation with their variable rep and, and you can give them some, some, some specific questions to ask uh, to identify really what's, what's the, how's that, that product performing and is it doing what it's needing to do and is, is, uh, or is thing, have things changed as far as what they're trying to accomplish? You know, these typical prospects, 50 to 70 years old, you know, the, what they've done is they want to, these clients as they're nearing retirement, they want to remove all market risk. And a lot of these VAs in the beginning of this year, especially, obviously we've had this pandemic, some huge losses. And, and now thankfully, a lot of those losses have rebounded and the clients are looking to, to potentially get out of that, get out of the market, get a little bit more guaranteed, uh, whether it's guaranteed growth or potentially guaranteed income. And, and really we can eliminate uh, substantial, some of these fees uh, associated with these variable annuities anywhere from three to 4% is sort of what I'm seeing typically with uh, all the sub account fees as well. But more importantly, it's, it's get to address those core client concerns. You know, when they bought that annuity it may have made sense for what they were trying to accomplish on the accumulation side, but now that maybe they're looking at an income distribution uh, type of situation, uh, or some of them are just concerned about that loss of principal, especially as they're nearing that re uh, retirement. Uh, it's not so much a return on their principal, return of their principal that's uh, most important to them. It, and what we're seeing is in the income space, for clients who had purchased variable annuity contracts with the intent to utilize them as part of a guaranteed lifetime income scenario, uh, oftentimes we can provide substantially higher income uh, with some fixed indexed uh, GMWB withdrawal alternatives. Um, and then uh, another policy review opportunity is reviewing old fixed, fixed annuities, not even fixed or fixed indexed annuities, but that have positive, that have a market value adjustment. Now, what is a market value adjustment? Market value adjustment is an additional charge or credit to an annuity contract that will pay them money if they leave the contract during a lower interest rate environment. So if I bought a, a fixed annuity and fixed rates were at 5% and I go to sell that, I go to surrender that annuity and fixed rates are at 3%, well, I might actually get money by leaving that contract. The carrier would actually pay me money to leave the contract. It's sort of like a, a bond of premium or discount. If I buy a bond at six and that bond selling for three, if I go to sell my 6% bond, I'm gonna make some money. I'm gonna get a premium on that because th that bond is currently yielding less 
today, if I were to buy it fresh today. So somebody will want to buy my 6% bond. It's the same goes for a, a fixed annuity contract with a market value adjustment. If you surrender that annuity contract, even in instances where they have a surrender charge, the carrier may actually pay you money to leave that contract. So then they can shop the marketplace and take a look and see what alternatives there may be of shift and what they're trying to accomplish with that annuity contract. Uh, so again, a number of reasons why they may want to do that, but at the very least you can see what options are out there. So today, especially, and when I say today, I mean literally in the last few weeks, we've seen dramatic drop <coughs> in the uh, interest rate environment. So it makes this positive MVA and this policy review uh, a very good thing to do. Uh, and this is a classic, you know, again, a lot of annuity clients are looking for fixed guaranteed rates of returns. So if you've got clients with money in annuities, annuities for, or money in certificates of deposits, I should say, uh, there's a lot of reasons why you, they might want to consider annuities, whether it's the tax differences on non-qualified annuity contracts, you have triple compounding. You have the, the interest that you earn on the interest, you have the interest that you earn on the principal, plus you have the interest on the money that you would have normally paid to taxes. And that can make a real big difference, especially uh, when they're at a higher tax rate today than they will be uh, I, uh, ideally in the future at retirement. So the, review the tax differences, review the access. You know, what withdrawals, if any, do they have on that CD? Annuities, they're gonna have interest only withdrawals or even 10% withdrawals. They're gonna have nursing home waivers or terminal else waivers. Uh, a lot of different ways that they can access that money that they might have, might not have with a CD, as well as look at their payout options. Might not be something that they're looking at now or considering now, but if this is their safe guaranteed uh, security money, you know, that guaranteed lifetime income is also a benefit that annuities can provide uh, over uh, certificates of deposit, as well as the death benefit and other features, as I mentioned, some of the waivers and things. You know, again, some simple questions you can ask clients. Uh, whether it's the returns on their CDs or some of the other guarantees. Again, we don't, we can't use the guarantee association as an enticement to sell, but if somebody were to talk about FDIC, you're absolutely able to talk about the guarantee association and how those uh, annuities are guaranteed through that. So uh, with that in mind, you know, some clients go, well, I'm just going to put it in this three month CD and wait for rates to go up, or I'm going to put it over here because rates are low and I, I don't want to lock it up too long because rates are going to increase. Let me tell if they're waiting for rates to increase, don't. We've got some great interest rates right now in the fixed rate environment. Uh, frankly, when I started doing this 20 years ago, five-year annuities were at 5%, five-year multi-year guarantee annuities. They haven't been at 5% in uh, 20 years. Uh, and frankly, frankly, they've been around the three to 4% range this whole time. So anybody waiting for 5% to come back and sitting in a low yield account, waiting for rates to go up, uh, they could be waiting a long time. And I actually have some great client handouts that talk about uh, the, the, um, uh, the cost of waiting for higher rates. I have a great uh, article here as well, and I'd be happy to send it out to everybody. It's, it's uh, Robert Ibbotson is an economist, and he did a comparison uh, of the uh, of below median and above median bond return environments from 1927 to 2016, and compared using fixed indexed annuities instead of a bond component as part of a mixed equities portfolio. So for so let's say somebody who was mixing stocks and bonds uh, as well as stocks, bonds uh, and, and fixed annuities or stocks and fixed indexed annuities solely, uh, we can see on those last uh, three columns, a stocks and fixed indexed annuity portfolio can actually return a comparable or better to a bond portfolio uh, component in, in that mix. Uh, as well as eliminate some of that uh, market risk as well. Uh, obviously with fixed indexed annuities not having uh, any market risk whatsoever. Um, so it's it's interesting uh, report. I'd be happy to send that out to uh, anybody that's uh, interested in taking a look at that as well. Uh, real quick, I won't spend a lot of time on uh, top fixed indexed annuity products because really the best product for your client uh, is the one that, that is the best contract for your client. Uh, but I'll share with you just a couple insights real quick. Single premium median annuity payouts are currently lagging behind uh, guaranteed minimum withdrawal benefit riders in indexed annuities. So for those of you who had utilized SPIAs as part of a guaranteed income scenario, we're actually seeing better income payouts utilizing income riders on indexed annuities. And I'll share with you just a couple of quick indexed annuities and some, some terms that I'm seeing uh, 
uh, some pretty attractive returns. This first contract happens to be uh, the index that they're utilizing is the two-year Barclays Trailblazer sex Sectors 5 index. This is a multi-asset strategy index, and this is a two-year term. Last 10 years is showing a return averaging of about 8.19 uh, annually, and then going back on a 15-year term and averaging about 4.59. You're seeing some of those uh, lower yields from 2008 sort of dragging that down. Um, and let me, excuse me, I got ahead of myself here. Um, and then also the uh, Guggenheim has got an interesting multi-asset uh, strategy. This is a volatility control index, the Mark V. Um, and this is on their Highlander 7 annuity. I like this particular contract just because it's a shorter term contract. And it's got pretty uh, uh, attractive yields over the last 10 years. And actually they show a best 10 years has a return of about 645. The worst 10 years has a return of about 5.21. So that's, again, a couple of index contracts that I think are relatively attractive. And here's where fixed rates are at right now. Right now, sort of the hot product is a five-year uh, fixed multi-year guarantee annuity contract with Sentinel at 3.35%. So uh, summary, lots of dates you should be aware of as far as your annuity contracts. I think that goes back to fact-finding. I have a lot of great fact-finding tools. Uh, and some, some fact-finding questions on annuities I'd be happy to share with you. Miners and trusts as owners and beneficiaries of annuities. There's some issues there. Let's talk about it. Make sure they're doing the right thing. Um, and then uh, Creditor Protection Guarantee Association. Uh, of course, we shared a couple of sales ideas and products as well. But ultimately, the best product for your client is going to be the one that makes the most sense for them. So review what you're doing. Make sure you're not making some of those planning mistakes. Assess your current book. And then, of course, feel free to give me a call and I'd be happy to share some insights. Let me share one thing real quick. People on this call, your Northwestern Mutual, your New York Life, your other carriage groups that you can't sell certain products, but you need a resource. You need somebody you can call. You need to get some insights. Call me. As a NAFA member, you're my brother. You're my sister. I want to make sure that you're successful. And, and as a fiduciary, I'm always going to do my best for you so you can do your best for your client. So if you're in a situation, you need some competitive insight. You don't know who to call. You, geez, I don't sell this. I can't sell this, but I need to know what this thing's all about. Give me a call. I'm going to give you an update and a heads up on what you need to do uh, to the best of my ability. So with that, thank you for allowing me to be a sponsor and serve uh, the association. Have a great meeting. Rest of the meeting, everybody. Thank you, Peter. That was, again, chock full of information, just like Shane. I, you guys are probably scribbling notes there as well. Um, but as uh, Peter mentioned, and I know Shane will be just as uh, easily available as well. If you guys have questions, reach out to them. They're here to help you. This is why there are sponsors and this is why they're here to support NEFA and support each one of you. So make sure you reach out to them if you have any questions, especially with the ton of material that you've been seeing. So with that, let us roll over to our special guest, Zach Hules. Zach is with the Home Office or the NAFA National. I call it Home Office lately. That's the terminology that's been used with me. So I'm going to say Home Office. Um, and I met Zach actually virtually, and it was through uh, doing a... Um, Oh gosh, Zach, you're gonna have to say the exact word of it, but I was uh, presenting a session on one of their practice management sessions, uh, and I believe it's recorded in somewhere on nafa.org. Uh, but that's how I got to meet Zach. And so I know he is the program engagement manager, and he uh, is a great contact for you if you need to know how to navigate a lot of the different value ads that you have through member benefits. And with that, I'm gonna hand it right over to Zach so that he can go ahead and share some really great information. Some is gonna sound really familiar because Suzanne Carolyn, who was on with us during the E3 conference was able to share a lot of information. So we just wanna do a one-two punch and make sure that you guys understand what great information you have. And uh, do you guys notice my background too? I changed it again. So anyway, with that, Zach, let me hand it over to you. Thank you for being with us today. Well, thanks Mimi. And I, I have to say in my, uh my my short career uh that is probably the greatest intro i've ever gotten so i do really really appreciate that and uh the program you were, you were talking about uh was the advisor ambassador program which i will touch on and i saw joanne delosa who's also also on this call uh is one of my also awesome advisor ambassadors but uh we're gonna go ahead and uh roll through here and as mimi said you know i'm the program engagement manager at the nafa home office 
Um, hope everyone is uh, enjoying the call so far. Just want to roll over some of the stuff that we have as some benefits in it. She, as she said, it may sound familiar to you. Um, maybe mention at the beginning of the call, we are uh, in our 130th anniversary of NAFA, and it's uh, very exciting. As it, as it says here, we're still making history. We did release a NAFA at 130 action report, which um, just outlines the state of NAFA this year in our 130 years, um, and just sort of what we've done in 2020, uh, especially during the COVID pandemic, and, and how we've pivoted. Um, and you know, the, as a long, running an association, you know, this is our second pandemic. So uh, NAFA has had to pivot a lot, especially over the last two years, as you may have noticed. And, uh, but we're, we're staying strong and, and vigilant through all of it. And um, we are still trying to power the possible. So I'm going to keep rolling through here. Uh, you may recognize this as the nafa.org website as you go on there and to find all of our great events and uh, pieces about the centers or some media. But what I'm going to talk about a little bit today is uh, the member login. So if you, um, if you, you may or may not be familiar with the member login, you go there and uh, that's where you get access to all of the, the, the nice bits of NAFA membership that aren't public to the rest of the world. We do have a lot of pieces on here that are public to everybody, but what are the benefits that you get as a NAFA member when you uh, sort of dive into the, the magical underground of the NAFA member side of the site? So one of the things, and I know I'm asked to talk about member benefits today, is uh, one of the things I want to talk about is the member benefits program, which is something we started, um, oh, I believe beginning of 2019, uh, we started this 12-month webinar series where each month we outline a certain area of NAFA membership that, uh, that is a benefit to you. And, uh, you know, we change them out year over year, but you can actually go to the member side of the site and under the differentiate tab, just part of the advocate, educate, differentiate uh, member promise. We do have the 12 months that you can sort of go back, watch at your leisure, uh, that talk about just a little uh, refresher for old members and, and a, something that we like, I shouldn't say old, seasoned members, and uh, for the newer members as well. So if you want some tips on how to plan out your whole year, whether as a NAFA member or in the business, that's great for month one. We have uh, awesome resources for uh, our Advocacy 101 if you wanna hear from our government relations team and talk a little bit about um, just how you can get involved in the political side of things, uh, especially during an election year like this one. Uh, we have uh, some of the ones that aren't uh, listed here are a whole deep dive into the Lilly program, which uh, I know is, is, um, is extremely valuable and a lot of our members talk a lot of, uh, have, have nothing but high praise to say about Lilly. Um, but, you know, some of the other ones coming up are our volunteer leadership track. So if you want to get involved as, as, a, as a member, uh, sorry, as a leader within NAVA, that's a great way to just sort of listen to some of our member chapter services team talk about how you can take those steps to become a leader and rise in the ranks and, and uh, become a speaker on a, on a national or a state platform. That's a, always a, a really nice way to, to get your name and face out there and really give back to the association. So that's just another uh, key highlight there. Uh, a couple pieces that you may or may not know, I uh, just want to go over them. Our NAFA newsletter that goes out uh, once a month. This is just our, you know, our comprehensive newsletter that talks about an advocacy update on the state or interstate level, or maybe even the federal level, uh, whatever is a hot topic going on on that section. An educate section that usually covers what sort of educational seminar workshops we're uh, cooking up for you all. And then a differentiate section, which has updates about our award season, um, you know, like the 400 or 40 or the diversity champion or um, maybe some call to actions. Maybe we want to get some NAFA members in front of the camera and we want to film them for uh, consumer content or for our uh, one of our centers. Uh, you may see it on one of those newsletters there. So the second one there is GovTalk, which uh, is a members only piece that goes out and it's all of the, uh, the legislative hits, things that have been happening over the last month. So there's a lot in there about the coronavirus bills that have been happening over the last few months, um, but that usually comes around mid-month, around the 15th of every month. Uh, and then in addition, we also have been sending out snapshots. So you have uh, a public snapshot that has all of the public webinars and, and public meetings that are happening. So our town halls were on there whenever we were doing town halls. And then the member events uh, usually come in a separate email, which is just thing, uh, members only type pieces like NAFA Live. If you haven't been to NAFA Live, highly recommend it. It's, a, it's a, our, our secret sauce of all membership. It's our membership meeting. So we do love to uh, see all of our members there at NAFA Live. 
Um, but yeah, you should be receiving these. I think they go out every other Tuesday. Um, and yeah, just uh, some event snapshots. But if you do ever want to check on what's happening next at NAFA, you can go to the public site or log into the member side of the site, which is recommended, and see what is uh, available. And all the public ones are available under the, the member side as well. Social media. Uh, if you guys are not active on social media, I do highly recommend that you get at least involved in, uh, in one, you know, LinkedIn. That's a big one, especially in uh, all of our businesses. But um, LinkedIn is, is huge. We, we post a lot there for um, just what's coming up in NAFA. So it's, it's another just uh, touch point that you can see uh, what's happening next. So you can stay involved. You can stay up to date and current. Um, Instagram and Facebook, those are, those are mostly for fun, but we do post a lot of uh, updates there as well. Uh, and if you have, you know, if you follow us, we'll follow you back. We'll, uh, we'll retweet you. We'll like you, you know, because we love our members. So we, we do want to see you out there. And we do use hashtag NAFA proud on our social medias a lot as well. Uh, the advocacy uh, section of the member side. This is where we house all of our blogs. It's very similar to what, what goes on in GovTalk. Um, just some uh, blogs to sort of refresh and really get involved in that political side of things. Um, and in the same, in the same uh, respect there, the NAFA, um, which I, I believe Jason did mention, um, the, the advocacy section of, uh, or the, sorry, this is where you can log your grassroots connection, really just get involved in the political side of things. Uh, I didn't mention NAFA Live. NAFA Live, just for those who maybe not know much about it, uh, started also last year, early last year, and um, our next upcoming one is November 12th with Delvin Joyce. And that one's going to be hosted uh, by NAFA Missouri. But um, again, just a great way for all of our members to get connected, um, go uh, to the meeting together, you know, chat, share best practices, and just sort of share ideas with what they've heard from the, the speaker that comes there every month. And um, yeah, so there's just more to, to talk there about NAFA Live as well. Uh, if you did not get a chance to attend our Performance Plus Purpose Conference, uh, we just wrapped it up last week. And we are going to be having our on-demand archives for this uh, coming this week. And you should be able to watch some of the, um, if you did register for the archive access and you want to see some of the, um, you know, the, the, the content on demand, uh, let us know. And we can maybe get you registered for archive access there. So, but we had a lot of great speakers there for um, uh, all the all the tracks for you know advanced planning tracks the one that I handled so I did see a lot of that but um, advisor today our advisor today digital magazine which is uh, all digital now and um, we are uh, constantly giving you updates on what's going on in some of the state level side uh, we we love to highlight our members here so if you do have some um, some content for other advisors, we would be happy to work with you to maybe get you published in uh, one of the, um, the bi-monthly editions and, uh, or maybe just get you on the blog, one of the other ways. And uh, for sponsors, if you ever want to, um, to uh, advertise on the Advisor Today blog, we also have that available too as well. There's also consumer resources on financialsecurity.org. So like I said, if you wanna get uh, your name and face out there in the consumer side of things, uh, we are always looking for videos that uh, we can do to highlight what our NAFA members do for their communities, for their Main Street USA. So uh, if you help small businesses or you help people retire or invest or uh, you help caregivers out, you know, you uh, work in the long-term care space, we want to hear from you and we want to know how you help out your clients and um, especially if your clients have been directly impacted in COVID-19 and I know that that's, you know, happening to a lot of people these days. So. Um, yeah, but uh, also on this site here is the find an advisor tool. So if you are a NAFA member and you have your work address populated in your NAFA profile, then you can be found on the find advisor tool. So if a uh, consumer goes on to the consumer site and looks for an, uh, a financial advisor, they type in their state and city and how far away they want to look and a NAFA member can be found right then and there on their find an advisor tool. So that's just another uh, way to get, to help out the consumers and uh, help you protect them. And I usually talk about this on our uh, orientations, but I do always like to remind people that when you're thinking about your year, when you're thinking about um, your NAFA membership, uh, how, just sort of think about the year in, in, in total. Like what, what are your goals? You know, map out what sort of um, 
what sort of connections you want to make or what sort of education you want to obtain. Maybe you want to get uh, another, uh, another certification or designation added onto your name. Um, just sort of have some goals in mind. And if there's any way that NAFA can help you achieve those goals, we always want to be there to, um, to help you either put you in touch with the NAFA staff person that can help you attain those goals or put you in staff with the NAFA member in your state or your local that can help you attain those goals. So um, another couple things I just really wanted to highlight real quick is uh, we have a lot of affinity programs on the member side of the site that can give you discounts to certain uh, benefits, even like a Lenovo if you're in the market to shop for new uh, laptop or UPS if you do a lot of shipping. Um, and then we also have some great centers. Like I said, we, have an, we had an advanced planning track at P plus P and we also have the long-term care center, the limited extended care planning center. And then the Talent Development Center, which houses all of our awards, like the uh, 440 and um, the NAFA Quality Awards as well. But uh, that's essentially it for uh, the presentation here. So I will go ahead and turn things back over to me. Thank you, Zach. Lots of great information there, too. I would encourage you, I, every time I go to the NAFA.org website, there's so much information there. So if you haven't yet figured out all the great things that are available to you at your fingertips because of your membership affiliation, then you're missing out on some great things. So make sure you're checking it out. And if you have any questions or need help navigating, Zach is available. You can always reach out to our executives, which I'll introduce at the end here. But we have Chris Dixon and Liz Nelson who are on our team that will help you out as well. So if you have any questions, you got resources, lots of them. All right, so let's keep moving along. I'm gonna introduce HOMA. And um, in introducing HOMA, I wanna, I wanna show you something that I think is really interesting because when I first met her, uh, HOMA was um, going, she was, I met her at the um, con Congressional Conference. Uh, it was the federal fly-in and she was uh, going to it for the first time. And I wanna share that with you really quick here. Why is that going? Okay, so that's Homa here on the right hand side and it was our first time. And so then after we met with Senator Feinstein, it was our last meeting of the day. Uh, then we went over to Old Ebbets Grill. So kind of shown this so you get a little FOMO, meaning when you go to the congressional conference, come join us because we always like to do a great, you know, finish the end of the day, going to the, one of the oldest bars in DC, which is literally across the street from the White House. Um, and then I realized that Jose was sitting next to us, and I didn't even realize that when I when we were uh, there at the at the last time. So I had had a chance to meet Jose since then. But without uh, further ado, let me go ahead and hand it over to Homa Rasuli. She is with Mutual of Omaha uh, Reverse Mortgage, and she will be sharing another great idea with us. She was uh, she shared a great idea with us back in August, and she's got another great idea having to do with long term care. So with that, Homa, let me hand it over to you. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you, Mimi, and thank you, NAFO team, for having me uh, to sponsor today. It's my pleasure to be able to do this. And each time I come in, I just want to give you some highlights about different options regarding the reverse mortgages, and maybe that way we can help our clients more and more to be able to help our seniors. And um, I'm Homer Rasuli. I'm a reverse mortgage specialist with Mitchell of Omaha. Mortgage, I've been doing reverse mortgages for about 14 years. And before that, I used to manage Wells Fargo branches for 30 years. And I've been a member um, of NAFA for many, many years. And I also served uh, as um, a board member in uh, Maureen uh, County NAFA uh, board. And uh, it was my pleasure. And it's really nice to uh, be able to still be around and uh, enjoy everybody and we had great time in washington dc and hopefully we can do it again mimi uh, so i'm looking forward for it um, i wanted to share some information about reverse mortgages what is reverse mortgages reverse mortgages are uh, fha insured product or uh, jumbo um, that is insured by the lender products for homeowners over 62 years old to be able to use equity of their home and turn it to uh, cash and uh, without any tax uh, consequences. And you can use the reverse mortgage for refinancing, 
for purchase for long-term care use as a line of credit. So I'm going to share some uh, article with you and go over that. And um, there's not enough time to uh, talk about so many different ways, but please you feel free to call me, to text me, to email me anytime. If you have any questions or if you have any clients that you want me to run illustration and analysis for them. Uh, reverse mortgages, let me see if I can share this uh, with you. So um, I wanted to talk about using housing wealth to address common long-term issues. As you can see, the reverse mortgages can be one of the um, situation if you have a client regarding long-term cares and they have problem of uh, funding it. So maybe reverse mortgage can be a, a solution for your clients. And um, we all know that the um, article, this article especially is, um, explain how a reverse mortgage can help your client address some common long-term care issues. Long-term care insurance policies are often difficult to sell. Despite the introduction of hybrid products, that minimize uh, loss of premium, the industry continues to languish even if the face of the risk coming from the rising cost of a long-term care. And of course, if the client wants, uh, waits too long, he faces underwriting issues and um, this uh, that, that would unduly strain the household budget. Finally, some existing policy homeowners uh, policy owners face premium cost increases that result in policy lapses, a, um, a sad affair, affair for advisor doing all they can do to help clients manage risk. And um, I wanted to bring an example of uh, a couple who use their reverse mortgage for a long-term care. And this couple had a house for $2 million all paid for. They had $2 million investments and they were about 70 years old, but they couldn't pass the long-term care um, underwriting. So they didn't have a long-term care. So what they did, they used the reverse mortgage line of credit. And since they didn't have any lien or any mortgages to pay off, they used the reverse mortgage line of credit. And one of the benefits of the reverse mortgage line of credit is uh, the growth factor. No matter what happens to the value of the house, the line of credit will grow um, half a percent more than their interest rate. So they qualify for about $400,000 uh, reverse mortgage line of credit, but by the time they are about 80, 85, to be able to use this long-term care, it will be double because of the benefits factor. So again, if you have any question regarding that, I'd be more than happy to help you with that. Um, in the baskets of a hard to sell financial products, reverse mortgages fit the same profile. Home ownership in retirement is exceedingly, uh, exceedingly high, estimated to be 80%. The uptake in this population for taking advantage of the roughly $7 trillion in senior home equity is growing, but it's still proportionally small. Like annuities, reverse mortgage rely on mortality credit, like actuarial principles so that no borrower can ever owe more than the value of their house, regardless of how long he lives or what housing value do. This is accomplished through FHA insured premium that occur on the loan balance, but provide absolute non-recourse status of the eventual outcome of the loan. So reverse mortgages are also non-recourse loans. A husband and wife get a reverse mortgage line of credit, can live in the house. The loan doesn't become due unless they sell or it's no longer their primary residence. So if one passes, the other one can still stay in the house. And when both of them passes, then the loan becomes due. And then their estate will sell the property, pass and um, pay off the bank and work with the rest of the equity. And if it is upside down, the loan balance is higher than the home value, it's a non-recourse loan. No one has to pay it back. And either the FHA will pay it back or the jumbo lender program, uh, the lender will cover that. And um, right now the retirement researchers are uh, really um, advising that to do the 
reverse mortgages in early stage of retirement rather than wait and do at the later stage. And uh, um, if a client of yours passes for the um, underwriting for long-term care, for the client who can be underwritten, the sting of draws on savings can be mitigated by turning to an alternative asset, the home. Because the reverse mortgage does not, does not require mandatory monthly payments, there is less pressure on the monthly budget. This is especially important in market downturn so that the client is not spending on the wealth asset. Generally, the cost of setting up a reverse mortgage would not make sense if the client plans to just use it for a couple of years. Reverse mortgage can be um, the proportion or the proceed of reverse mortgages can be lump sum and uh, that can buy a policy with a one-time single pay using reverse mortgage lump sum to pay for the long-term care. And reverse mortgage tenure payments is like an annuity as long as they still stay in their house. And then also um, provides monthly cash flow for household budgets to accommodate continuous pay. So we have different options available for reverse mortgages and um, it can help your clients. And there is a decision tree charts that um, when Emily sends this uh, out to everybody, you can review this. And if you have any more questions on that, please give me a call and we can discuss that. And for clients who cannot be underwritten uh, for the long-term care, then, or they'll refuse or consider a policy because of the budget demand, reverse mortgage offers a powerful alternative that allows the client to self-insure. And that's the line of credit. The line of credit with the reverse mortgage cannot be frozen, reduced, or canceled. There is no monthly debt services, and uh, whatever the loan balance becomes is satisfied by the home value, whatever it may be. And if the line of credit is not used, there is no loss on the equity beyond the lending cost. All remaining equities are loans and uh, belongs to the borrower and their estate. So there is um, uh, reverse mortgages can be used for any purposes on this and pay for the long-term care. And in conclusion, uh, in the financial planning community, the housing asset is really used to provide a long-term care solution. Advisors have tended to leave the house as a last resort, but now they are suggesting to use it as an early resort. Um, this a proven strategy that does not account for market volatility or for future health spending shocks for the vast majority of seniors who wish to age at home. Finally, the reverse mortgage provides a means for expanding the inflow budget to purchase long-term care insurance or prevent policy lapse without imposing a monthly debt obligation. So please let me know if there is anything I can do to help you figure out about reverse mortgages for your clients over 62. We have Jumbo product right now for over for um, prop, property values over 850 and the proceed can be up to $3 million. I'd be more than happy to help anybody and thank you for having me and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Homa. Really appreciate your sponsorship and the great ideas that you shared with us today. So thank you for being with us. And so glad to have met you back there at that congressional conference back in DC. So hopefully next year, we'll be able to have another congressional conference moment. All right, we are down to our last couple of sessions. Um, another, bet you better get your piece of paper out and pen out because there's gonna be a lot of great ideas here, a Roth alternative. Um, if you remember from our uh, August meeting, we had Chris Bohr from Kansas City Life on with us and he has sent in his big guns. Uh, Dwayne, oh, Dwayne, I was about to say, <laughs> Turnage. Dwayne Turnage and Donna Siner. Uh, <laughs> Dwayne is, uh, he's the AVP or Assistant Vice President of Sales and Marketing Services. And Donna, well, she is the big gun. Just watch. She's going to show you a lot of great information. She's in advanced sales with Kansas City Life. And again, like I said, a lot of great ideas going to be coming down your way, 15 minutes, and you're going to be scribbling. So with that, Kansas City Life, Donna and Dwayne, thank you so much for being with us today. Really appreciate your sponsorship and your partnership.
There, okay. We're getting close. Okay, can everyone see my slides now and hear me fine? Okay, good. We're gonna talk about life insurance as a Roth IRA alternative today. That's a concept that's been around for a long time. There's nothing dramatically new in this. However, the world has changed. Um, we've got to really start looking at retirement savings now and saying it's not all about how much you accumulate for retirement, but we're also going to have to factor in taxes. We've always talked about taxes. I mean, that's really in itself nothing new. But the reason that it has changed is because of the national debt. We all know that because of COVID-19 and the stimulus package that went in, that we have, you know, it's just escalated. I mean, the US national debt, look at this. I mean, it's shocking when you think about it, it went up $1.5 trillion in six weeks. That's unbelievable. That's on May 7th, 2020. Um, if you're interested, you can always go out to, there's, there's a, a usdebtclock.org that you can look up and it'll give you each day what the national debt is. Well, with the stimulus package that went out, it just skyrocketed. Well, we've got another potential of another stimulus package coming. And, you know, we don't know. People are talking about this COVID and some people are saying that in a few months we'll be back to normal. Other people are saying that it's going to be more than a year before we are back to normal. And so we know that we are accumulating more uh, debt all the time. Well, the government really only has two ways to get us back on track. They either have to spend less or they have to tax more. And I think almost everyone agrees that we're probably going to see an increase in taxes. I mean, as a planner, I think we've all talked about taxes in the last 20, 25 years. But at the same time, we've been in a very low tax rate during that time. I mean, even if you go back to the Reagan era, the top tax bracket at that point was 77%. But then we had a lot of um, tax alternatives that would shelter. And so people really weren't paying that much in taxes at, uh, most of the time. But I think we're gonna see those tax rates really escalate. So now we've got a serious problem because we have baby boomers who have 85% of their money for retirement in qualified plans. That means that when that money is distributed, it is all going to come back as taxable income. Well, they're at a point where they really can't do much to avoid taxation, except that I really am promoting that agents look at the potential of if you've got clients in their 50s and 60s and they have a disproportionate amount of their retirement savings in qualified plans, which is all going to be taxable when they come out, to start moving some of that into tax-free alternatives. And what do we have for tax-free alternatives? Not much. We have Roth IRAs and we have life insurance. Now you can do, if you have money in a qualified traditional IRA plan, you can do a conversion into a Roth IRA. But if your money is in 401ks, um, SEPs, other types of qualified plans, then life insurance is really gonna be the only way that you can get into a tax-free environment. The other side of the coin is for your younger clients. They are just now starting to save for retirement. It used to be that I would say to agents, nobody's going to think about retirement until they're at least 45 or 50. That's when you're going to start talking to them about retirement. That's not true in today's environment. Um, most individuals in their 20s are thinking about retirement. Um, I was just talking with a, a young man last week who is 22 years old, and he was setting up his Roth IRA so that he could make contributions for retirement. And one of his questions was, if we look at the contribution limits for Roth IRAs, the maximum he can put in is 6,000 a year, and it starts phasing out the ability to do that at 124,000 for a single individual. This young man knows 
that he's going to be making $150,000, $200,000 by the time he's in his late 20s. For him, Roth is not going to be a real alternative. He can put money in now and he can get started with a Roth. But long term, he can't put enough money in there to save for retirement. So he's going to have to use life insurance. But unfortunately, out there in the industry, out in the marketplace as a whole, there's still this concept that we use life insurance um, for death needs planning. Even though more than 85% of the people that buy life insurance today buy it for the living benefits, they still are thinking about it as the death benefit. And they're thinking that it's costly to invest and save for retirement inside of a life insurance contract. But when you look at, there's only two alternatives. There's Roth and there's life insurance. And you really start looking at the advantages of the life insurance, suddenly it makes a lot of sense to look at the life insurance closer. Now, Dwayne's gonna go on and talk to you a little bit about how life insurance really works as that alternative. Dwayne, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Donna. Appreciate it. Yeah, as she said, you know, life insurance is uh, more than just death benefit. And, and I know that Chris spoke to you, uh, Chris Bohr spoke to you in your last meeting about 15 reasons why uh, you can use life or should use life insurance in retirement planning. And that uh, brochure is, is there on the screen. Uh, he would be more than happy to provide that for you. I'm not going to reference it very much in this talk, but uh, I know he did an excellent job in presenting that last time he was with you. And uh, that's something that he can continue the conversation on. Uh, but selecting the right product is really important. And uh, one product, uh, there, there are many uh, life insurance products that you can select. And, and Donna, we can go ahead and go to the next one. When, we, uh, when we're looking at all of the different alternatives, really any cash value life insurance or type of cash value life insurance can be uh, uh, important. But the IUL is one that we have really seen exponential growth in, uh, Index Universal Life. It's one that really, uh, when I was selling uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, you know, I really hadn't had much exposure to and, and we've seen, uh, we have seen exponential growth in this product line and, and uh, it does some really great things and, and want to talk to you about that today. Of course, it, it has all of the things that Donna talked about, tax-free access to cash, the no mandatory in, uh, distributions. But the big thing with uh, IUL is the potential that it has for upside growth and the potential for downside protection. And that's really what agents are selling and that's what clients uh, are buying. Uh, again, there's no income restrictions for how much money you can put in an IUL, as, as Donna was saying. And uh, the living benefits, I, I can't stress enough, that is, a, uh, that is a really huge factor when making this decision. What kind of benefits can uh, clients access during, your, uh, during their lifetime? And of course, there's death benefits, as, as all life insurance policies would have. As we are all attempting to engage with this uh, prudent fiduciary process that we are all engaged in, you know, it's important to document in your files how you came to the decision or, or what product that, uh, how you decided what product that you would choose. And of course, it's important to document it. You really have to know why you selected the company that you recommended. And uh, it's important to get down to the details and, and, and really have it documented. Of course, our agents would say things like, it's our 125 years of sound financial performance, uh, maybe company ratings, you know, the fact that, we, you know, that we have our best ratings that we can have for the size of company that we are, our Midwest values, the fact that we have zero debt as a company. It, it could be those things, but for you, for whatever company you're representing, it's important to know why you're recommending the company that you are and to talk about uh, you know, what that might hold for the client. But it's also important to know what product that you're recommending. And, and the thing about index universal life policies that we really have to be careful with is they, 
they really do range widely in cost. Cost, benefits, and features. And you really have to, uh, you really have to know your product well. You have to document it well for your client to know that here's why we selected this product. Here's why we think that it's important. And then get into the details of, of uh, why it might be good for them. So again, I mentioned, I mentioned Chris, and, and Chris is an excellent uh, ambassador for us uh, in your area. I know he's served, uh, he served uh, California NAFA. He's, he's also serving in, the, in Washington State where he's currently active. We, we at Kansas City Life really value the contribution of NAFA to our industry. We've always been big supporters and we continue to be big supporters. I thank you all, everyone on the call for all of the hard work that, that you are doing on behalf of our industry. That's why we are sponsors and uh, we appreciate it <clears throat> very much. Uh, I do want to uh, kind of close with uh, something that Ben Feldman said. He, he's one of the greatest life insurance salesmen uh, probably ever. And this is our biggest sales tip of the day. And that would be, uh, don't sell life insurance. Sell what life insurance can do. And Donna really talked about that uh, as a Roth IRA alternative. Life insurance can not only provide death benefit for your clients, but of course, uh, can help them save. Again, we here at Kansas City Life want to thank you uh, for your participation in NAFA. I think Donna had something to add. No, I just wanted to say, you know, I uh, going forward, you know, do please keep in mind as you're as you're working with your clients that those clients who are they need to be concerned about the tax situation because it is going to change dramatically over the next few years. And then for our younger clients, it is so important. So. Kansas City Life is proud to be a sponsor and um, we are always here to help you. That's it and I'll turn it back over to Mimi. Thank you, Donna and Dwayne. I don't know if you saw in the chat, Dwayne, I wanted to make sure I gave you props. You are also a big gun too. So I wanted to make sure I gave you, I didn't want to put you down. You weren't, you weren't being put down. <laughs> So with that, thank you, Kansas City Live. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Dwayne. Great information. Um, we will make everything available to everybody here on the call so that if you have any follow-up and again, reach out to our sponsors. Get them to get involved with the case that you're working on. If you need more information, I know they're ready to help you. So this is why we love our sponsors and why we really value the partnerships that we do have with them because they care. They care about you. They, they're members themselves, and they want to make sure that you're being successful with your practices and your clients. So let me take the next 10 minutes and kind of give you a, a snapshot of what you're going to see this next year. Uh, we've got 15 months. Uh, we're sort of like that, you know, that chicken that's just hatching out of their egg or sort of stretching our bodies out. And so you're going to start seeing a lot of information in the next few months here, and we'll really kick it into gear. Um, you know, I'm really big on community. That's what's important for me to see 43 people here on this call, to have seen over 250 people sign up for the E3 conference. We had over 130 people on it at any given time. So that's cool. That's awesome. And this is why I also love going to the P plus P conference. This is why I love going to the state conference. So I love going to ConCon. You know, it is our opportunity to connect and be together and be in that community. You know, I think about the community and I want to share something really quick with you. Um, our community is what you're about to see here. So I shared a, a picture a moment ago. And this is our, our P plus P last year. Just a short year ago, we were all in Orlando together. And this is such a fun picture. Uh, it really conveys the togetherness, the community. Uh, from people from all over and there's Chris for himself, although he's now in Washington. I mean, he still has his California relationships. Uh, here's John winning a bottle. If you can see right here, he's got the little, uh, he's got the little um, toss circle and it's about to land on that bottle that he just won. Our three winners, that's Dion out of our San Francisco office, Jennifer Williams in the middle there and John Neilmeyer. We've got everybody dancing. Again, this is like the great community that we have. This is us at the um, initial leadership meeting where Tom Michael was, was addressing the group. 
This is your board. This is from a couple of years ago and we continue to work together. This was our, um, our uh, day on the hill last year, just last year. And I know this year we didn't get a chance to do it, but what a great group of people that come together because we care about our industry. We care about what we do. Um, here's Peter leading the charge uh, for our P plus P, our, I'm sorry, our ConCon -Con last year. Congressional conference is what I'm saying when I say ConCon. -Con. Uh, again, Peter leading the charge here. And then Michael Matas uh, at, with us at the same place where Homa, we showed you a picture of Homa just a moment ago, uh, over at old Evans Scroll and Chris, uh, Chris Bohr there too. So with that, I just wanted to just remind you that that's our community. That's just a small snapshot. And I bet you anything, you all have great pictures as well that you can share and show that community. Um, you know, I, I, this year we had to go virtual. This is why it was so important for me that I really wanted us to have this opportunity to connect together virtually um, and to be on camera with all of you guys and to be able to see your faces. So thank you for being here with us today virtually as well as back in August. Um, I know that Tom Michael had to pivot as well as his presence is coming up and he had to do P plus P, but great, great uh, material and great topics. I don't know if you guys had a chance to listen to Morris Morrison. I thought he was, he did a great job. I almost couldn't tell that it was a recorded session. So again, when I think about how we can communicate our why, why are we part of NAFO? Why are we here in this community? And I look at, you know, the three areas, our three areas of advocacy, membership and member benefits. In advocacy, you know, we're protecting ourselves, we're protecting our industry, we're, we're protecting what we do for our clients. Peter and his team uh, with John Neilmeyer, Trent, um, we had Michael, we had um, Sherry McHugh, who is our lobbyist. If you had a chance to meet her, you will get a chance in the future. She has always lobbied for us and they've shared a lot of their wins. If advocacy isn't something that you've been really tuned into, make this your year to do that. Turn on your PAC contributions. Make it a $10 a month. Make it a $15 a month. You probably spend that on lunch or a cup of coffee or a couple of cups of coffee each, each month anyway. Why not contribute towards your PAC dollars to help protect what you do for your clients? Make this the year. Make this the year that you do it the, for the first time if you've not done it. Make this the first year that you go out and talk to a legislator in your district. Make this the year, hopefully we get to go to ConCon Con, uh, next year. Make this the year to, to get involved with advocacy. And then in terms of membership, we can't have a strong voice on Capitol Hill without having a, a, a number of members there. Brute force in membership is what we need. And we know that if you've talked to any of the past presidents in the years past, they'll say, well, we had so many members. We had thousands and thousands of members. Well, guess what? We're in a new normal. So let's make sure that we bring on as many members as we can this year. Jason's competitive. I love that. Texas and Florida are just ahead of us. We're going to catch up with them. We want, we want to be number one. And so with your help, it's sort of the each one reach one. Well, make this the year that you ask, Hey, why don't you come to a meeting with me? We're doing it virtually. Come join us. Hey, did you know that we did X, Y, and Z from an advocacy standpoint to help protect our industry? How can you contribute to that membership drive? What can you do this year? Make this year the year that you bring in a new member, just one. And, you know, when we think about um, member benefits and your value of affiliation, Zach was able to share a lot of great information with us today. It was sort of almost a, some of it was just a reinforcement of stuff that we've heard before, but this is the year that you really kind of dig in and see what kind of great benefits you've got. Um, we saw some great questions come in. Make sure that you're checking out our great um, member benefits and make this the year that you're going to post something about social media and hashtag NAFA proud. In fact, if you've got screenshots today, post it and, and tag NAFA California, tag one NAFA. Make sure that we get our footprint out there. The more and more you do it, the more and more we collectively do it, the more and more our voice is, is heard. And, you know, with member benefits, one of the key member benefits that we have every year is Lilly, Leadership and Life Institute. I'm a graduate from 2006, and somebody I'm going to introduce in just a moment here was in my class. 
And, you know, this year, because we're going to be moving to a calendar year, we're going to shift when we're going to ask for uh, applications and we're going to shift when we start the class. So keep your eyeball out for that. If you've talked to anybody who's gone through Lily, it was sort of the cautious, what am I getting myself into? It's a six month commitment. But every single person that walks out of that program says, wow, I loved what I did. I, and, the, and the connections they create with their classmates are forever. And like I said, I have somebody who I have in my class that I get to um, introduce you to because we get to work together now. So with that, let me introduce to you Shal Daniels. Shal, you are hopefully can turn on your camera. And I want to introduce you because Shal is going to be our new um, treasurer for the board. And I'm so excited to be able to work with him after all these years. We sort of been two, um, two ships in the night in terms of serving at different boards at different times. And I know that we've uh, always sort of been connected, but uh, I want to make sure that Shal, are you here with us today? Perfect. There you I'm are. Here. All right. Let me spotlight your video. Hi, Shal, and thank you so much for serving as treasurer. We're looking so forward to your leadership, and uh, congratulations. I hope <laughs> on being. Thanks, Megan. Great, great program today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. And so with that, let me lead that right into my next thank yous. I want to make sure I thank um, our board. The board here is so behind you and so uh, wanting to make sure that they are. Um, let me just get everybody here I'm I'm promoting everybody to panelists right now. So if you're seeing me pull you through, I feel like I'm some sort of witchery I'm able to pull people through and so I'm pulling them through onto um, the screen here and so board members uh, for those of you who are still with us today please turn on your cameras I want to thank you all but I will name everybody uh, Sarah Martin she is your uh, secretary this year and she's going to be your president-elect uh, well actually she's your president-elect like, excuse me so she'll be your next president right after me so if you've noticed we got Jennifer Williams who just finished her presidency me, I'm here now, and Sarah next. We got three years of female presidency. We're pretty excited. All right, and then Ted Lim, Richard Coffin, Jason Foster, Shal Daniels, I just introduced you to, John Neilmeyer, Peter Buchler, Jennifer Williams, Mark Bregman, and Michael Mates. I want to thank each and every one of you for being on the board, serving yet another year, and uh, giving all of you to serve our, our membership here in, in California. So thank you for all that you will be doing and that all that you have done. And uh, we saw many of you today, but want to thank you again for uh, serving with me um, and serving NAPA California. So what are we about this next year? We are, and we're right at 12 o'clock, um, we're about leadership. I want to I want to see more leaders grow and develop within the organization. I want to see retention. I want to see us really retain our members because you're here. Let's make sure you understand your why, why you're here with us. And I want to make sure that we continue to foster community. The community is important and it's why we like to stay together and why you saw those pictures just now. We like being with each other. So let's continue that community spirit. And I think that with that, in, in addition to our efforts in advocacy, membership, and member benefits, we're going to rock and roll this year. So thank you for being with us today. Really appreciate you. And uh, I can't wait to see you guys face to face sometime soon, I hope. Um, but in the meantime, virtual will be great. And I can't wait to see you on these virtual meetings in the future. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you to all our speakers, our sponsors, and thank you board. And uh, we hope you have a great week. Bye, everybody.